the mesh book characters, in order to do so, like it brings in like not only adults and teens, it brings in kids too. That's really what invites people into the scene. So in a way we could say that it was a, it wasn't really meant for competitive play, or is that really what he desired? But today we wanted to talk about Super Smash Bros. Melee, which created this really intensive competitive metagame uh, with the uh, like esports. So we wanted to ask the question, what really caused the rise of the competitive metagame? In essence, it was mainly the players who took Melee in a very different direction than the one soccer right here. Even from the very beginning, they found a fast and intense quality for Melee's gameplay, and they felt the urge to compete and prove themselves. This led to a lot of in-game experimentation and this, the discovery of techniques to raise the bar for competitors. In addition, people started organizing tournaments, big events with past prizes, and this incentivized competition. As these tournaments grew in size, the rule sets became standardized, cash prizes grew, and talented players from Europe, Japan, and Latin America all came to the U.S. for a chance to compete. This growth continued well until Nintendo Rebel was going on. They must not have liked the way the community was playing the game because they ordered the complete shutdown of the largest Melee tournament to date, EVO 2013. But after just two days, the community actually convinced Nintendo to change their decision. It's actually amazing that a bunch of nerds playing on the game managed to over the de overturn the decision of a super massive corporation like Nintendo, and it really demonstrated the passion and the strength of the community, which drew even more attention to the scene. Another one of the largest factors that spurred the interest was a fan film and independently published documentary series called The Smash Brothers, released not long after the book was made. In fact, the professors showed a quick documentary device and several years ago. It was widely praised, especially since it was made entirely by fans today, and it brought millions of eyes to the table smash. Ever since then, the whole community has still continued to grow. So before we uh, dive deep into it, we're going to have Raymond like you know, warm up with the CRT uh, world, like the so we can show you like the metagame in general. But before that, we want to talk about some of the lingering questions that people have. Yeah, so one very common question people have about Melee is why did you play on the old CRT over there? Mm -hmm. okay. Well, to answer that, Melee came out on the GameCube in 2001. Back then, CRTs were very common, so the console was designed to handle inputs for the CRT. As a result, the most fluid and natural gameplay comes from playing on a CRT, and that's what people still do today. Yeah, another question that people ask is, why do people play an 18-year-old Smash game? You know, why not just play the newest in the series? Why play this old one? Well, the question of that is, you know, well, why do people speedrun Doom? Or why do people play Tetris? or chess or tennis. That's like thousands and thousands of years old. Right? The, the answer is generally we want to play classics. We want to improve. You know, we don't necessarily want to you know, always be better at like the later stages. And technically, Melee has this really, really decent, like fast combat that the later series just doesn't get. That's why people are so interested in it. Yeah, and the final question uh, that's frequently asked is why there's so many restricted rules? Why are items turned off in certain games can. Well, in a competition, it's, the goal is to get someone's skill, <coughs> intellect, or physical capability against someone else's. For example, in a short race, you want to have, uh, to see who's fastest, you have two people running <coughs> the same distance, right? You don't have them drive cars because that would be unfair. The same thing goes for Smash Bros. You don't want to turn on items or have some stages that make things unfair or random and decide the match solely based off of those factors instead of something on the scale. So now that we're like, uh, out of like the general question, uh, we're going to have Raymond demonstrate some of the mechanics. Uh, like the way the LPs right again, right? I'm going to demonstrate two melee techniques for all of you and explain how the discovery and the implementation of these techniques have changed the this. First off, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the term wave dash. At the present. <laughs> now, <laughs> raise your hand if you can. Well, don't worry. In just five minutes, you will all know what a wave is and how to do it. development team made sure they had plenty of defensive options for you. Okay. You can shield, you can roll, you can spot them, and you can air dodge. It was quickly discovered, quickly discovered that you could air dodge in any direction, including into the ground. And once people started air dodging diagonally, they found that if you did that, you could slide across them like you ice cream. Thus, the wave dash was born. 
all the wave dash is is jumping for a split second. And then air dodging diagonally down left or down right. So what impact did this have on how people play band? For starters, notice that in my wave dash, I can go either left or right, but I'll still continue facing my original direction. This move right here is called my backwards aerial attack, otherwise known as my back hit. It's strong and it's fast, but it only comes out backwards. So, in most cases, if I want to use it, I've got to have my back facing my opponent. But I can't run it and use it, so I'm not turn back to it. If I wave dash, I can continuously threaten my back and get my back <laughs> turned to my opponent and hit him whenever time for Second, wave dashing is super fast, allowing you to traverse the entire stage in this second. Because wave dashing is so fast, I can use it to trick my opponent into thinking they know where I'm going. When someone is running at you aggressively, their first instinct is to avoid them or to hit them before they touch the spread. Well, with a carefully placed wave dash, I can trick my opponent into thinking that I'm running at them, when in fact, I'm baiting them into throwing out an attack, which causes them to let their guard down, and then I'm striking them out. In short, players who could wave dash suddenly had a whole new method of moving it, and this technique shape and spurt growth in the Now it's on to our second technique, called the l cancel. While the wave dash was the physics exploit of Melee's end, the l cancel was a technique that was purposefully programmed into by the developers. By pressing either shoulder trigger, L or R within one tenth of a second before you hit the ground during an aerial attack, you can cut the amount of time you spend getting up to the attack. And despite that strict indoor requirement of one tenth of a second, L canceling still has extensive use for different play. So, how did it change the way people played? The basic principle of all fighting games, fighting sports, and fighting in general is to leave yourself vulnerable for as little time as possible. It's pretty self explanatory, so it's the less time you're vulnerable, the less time your opponent has to get a free kill. Let's say I throw my back here. Notice when I land, there's a period of landing on it. I can't do anything until this animation finishes. Naturally, if I shorten the amount of time I'm stuck in this animation, I'm going to have an advantage because I'm decreasing the time period more vulnerable. And when I help cancel, I do exactly this. I'm decreasing the window where I'm stuck. Now I can back here. In addition, by L cancel, players could chain together sequences of aerial hits, allowing for combos, juggles, and KO. If I don't L cancel, I can't juggle my phone. Juggling is nothing but a distant dream because I'm stuck in lag. <laughs> Notice how he gets to the ground before he can do anything. But, if I L cancel, suddenly that dream is becoming reality. I can juggle. <laughs> and I can secure chaos. Players who get L cancel consistently can move faster and hit harder than those who shouldn't. And in the fast paced competitive environment of family, this meant that if you didn't want to fall behind everybody else, you were going to have to learn how to L cancel. In conclusion, these two techniques, wave dashing and L cancel, drastically changed the way people played by adding movement options, increasing the speed of the game, and vastly expanding the potential for dynamic and vigorous game. That about wraps up our tech demonstration. We'll give one more section of the presentation. <laughs> right. So now that we've seen exactly how competitive players like to play the game, that leaves us with an even bigger question. Why does that even matter? Well, esports and competitive gaming are larger than ever. Games like League of Legends or Overwatch regularly get hundreds of thousands of views on their matches. For example, the recent Wall World Championship peaked at 3.7 million viewers, while in comparison to Big House 9, a melee tournament, peaked at, around, uh, at about 100,000 viewers. While there may seem to be an unbridgeable gap of viewership between the two, these are actually really good numbers for melee, all things considered. The thing that melee and Smash don't have that esports giants like League of Legends or Overwatch have is money. The developers of these games heavily endorsed their competitive scene and poured millions and billions into developing it. On top of this, 
and the investors also pour millions into franchising teams or signing pro uh, high profile players. Competitive Smash, particularly Melee, have had, until recently, a complete lack of backing from Nintendo in terms of endorsements or sponsorships. Without this backing from Nintendo, financially or otherwise, it's up to the community to keep things alive and keep things going, basically. So Smash is like a completely grassroots effort from the ground up. And even without the million dollar uh, brand partnerships or sponsorship with Nintendo, they're still able to put together some incredible things. For example, Project Slippy, whose icon you can see in the back, is an HD software designed for Melee to be streamed uh, and allow for data analytics that are not available in the game. And the Smashbox, which was designed recently, was designed uh, as a arcade style controller allows people to play without getting the hand pain that is frequent from many players. So finally, closing note on the future of Melee and Smash. So recently we've been seeing Nintendo's interest in competitive Smash more and more. For example, they have started holding online tournaments for the newest game, Smash Ultimate, and they use most of the same rules as the competitive community does, so that's really good. There have also been some Melee partnerships, uh, such as their partnership with Get On My Level 2019, and in conclusion, if Nintendo ever does start fully supporting Smash tournaments like they have started to, started to do, uh, perhaps one day we will see Smash 3 rise up and rather than other TV sports. And with that note, we